How's it going, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Buddy's House of Horror podcast. This is the story of one of the greatest vampire hunters in history. Maybe you've heard about him, or rather what they let you hear about him, probably is some minor item in the back of a TV guide somewhere. But seriously, this is the Coal Shack's 50th anniversary special, the 50th anniversary of the Night Stalker film. If you've never seen the Coal Shack films or the television series from back in the 70s, this podcast is going to give you an introduction to everything that you need to know in order to get started. If you're a seasoned vet, you already know and love Carl Coal Shack, so I hope you just join me along for the ride as I celebrate the 50th anniversary of the original film. We're just going to get right to the conversation. I tried to keep this discussion very loose, and I didn't want to go too much in depth into any particular film or episode or book from the series. I just wanted to have a general discussion all about Coal Shack, why I love Coal Shack, and why this is all so important to me. So this isn't really a deep dive, more or less just an introduction for those who may not have heard of Coal Shack, or maybe those who just love Coal Shack and they want to hear me talk about it. So I wanted to just keep this loose, open-ended, and at some point in the future I would love to do a deep dive about some of the Coal Shack films, episodes of the show, whatever you guys want to see, just let me know. But as far as this episode, it's just a celebration of all things Coal Shack. Again, if you're a seasoned vet, I hope you join me along for the ride. And if this is your first time hearing about Coal Shack, I hope that you find what I have to say informative and interesting. And we're just going to get right to the episode. I tried to keep it at just about an hour, so not too long of a discussion. Had I gone really in-depth, this could have been like a two, three-hour discussion with myself. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep this short and manageable and listenable. So we're just going to get right to the episode. But before we do that, if you guys haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications so you know when I put out new videos over on YouTube. And if you're not subscribed over on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to the show, make sure you go ahead and do that. And yeah, without further ado, we're just going to get right to the episode. So now let's get spooky and let the whistling begin. Chapter 1. This is the story behind one of the greatest manhunts in history. Maybe you read about it, or rather what they let you read about it, probably is some minor item buried somewhere on a back page. However, what happened in that city between May 16th and May 28th of this year was so incredible that to this day the facts have been suppressed in a massive effort to save certain political careers from disaster and law enforcement officials from embarrassment. This will be the last time I will ever discuss these events with anyone. So when you have finished this bizarre account, judge for yourself its believability. And then try to tell yourself, wherever you may be, it couldn't happen here. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, boys and ghouls, and welcome to 2022, and welcome to a brand new episode of Buddy's House of Horror podcast. This is technically the middle of season four, but it's a brand new year. 2022 is upon us. I'm hoping it is a much better year than the past couple years that we've been given. I hope things are finally on the upturn and things start getting a little bit better in the world. Um, But I hope you guys had a great holiday season. I hope you had a great new year. Um, I hope you got plenty of spooky gifts for Hanukkah, Christmas, whatever you celebrate, if you celebrate anything, and if not, I hope you just had a good start to winter. Um, Right now, Ohio winter is in full swing. We're getting our first snows of the year. We didn't have any snow around Christmas, but now it's really starting to come down. Of course, today is January 11th, a very, very special day, um, and a day to celebrate the 50th anniversary of of the Night Stalker film, Carl Kolschak. Um, One of my new favorite horror franchises, horror characters, however you want to say it. Um, It's weird to me that I've only recently discovered this in the past six, seven years or so. Um, And it wasn't something that I had been watching previous to that. Uh, But we're going to get all into Carl in a second. Um, But I just want to give a few updates about what's been going on with the House of Horror, what I've been doing recently. 
You know, I've just been trying my best to hang out, man. I've been trying my best to hang out with my wife. I've been trying my best to keep in touch with my family whenever I can. It's been very, very busy these past few months with me, you know, leading up to Christmas and stuff like that with my job and all that. Um, so I've just been trying my best in the past, like, week or so to just sort to start get back to normal. And I'm actually already planning for my House of Horror Marathon for 2022 in October. I'm starting to get some ideas together of what I want to do. Um, and I've just been really excited over the break, of course, and this will tie us into Coal Shack a little bit. Um, I had the honor and privilege of being a part of the Coal Shack's Loop Christmas special. Um, so if you guys are listening to this podcast somehow about Coal Shack and you haven't heard of the Coal Shack's Loop before, it is the premier Coal Shack podcast um, hosted by my good friends Robert and Bradley. Um, definitely go check out their show. I was on their Halloween special and their Christmas special. Um, but the Christmas special was great. We broke down a bunch of Christmas horror films. Um, so if you're still in the holiday spirit, which I know... Christmas time, it sort of lingers its way into January. You know, Christmas just starts whenever it wants and ends whenever it wants. So if you want to hear a good Christmas special about some Christmas horror, definitely check out the Coal Shack's Loop episode that I was on for Christmas. Um, but again, I'm sure you've heard of the Coal Shack's Loop if you're listening to this podcast about Coal Shack, because as I said, they are probably the most major Coal Shack podcast that is going on at this moment. Um, and I'm assuming you're a Coal Shack fan if you're listening to this episode right now. Or if you're not a Coal Shack fan, I hope that I give a good sort of introduction to the show and the series. Um, the series and show are the same thing. I meant movie um, and the sequel, of course. And if you've never heard of it before, I'm going to try to break things down for you guys. This is just going to be a casual discussion. I'm not going to go too in-depth about anything in particular. I just sort of want to talk about the two films. I want to talk about the show and give an introduction to this great character in this great world that maybe some people hadn't heard of before. Um, like me, I hadn't heard of The Night Stalker. I hadn't heard of Coal Shack. Um, until I was in my final year of grad school, um, I was taking, of course, the, from those of you that know, uh, Mark Dewidziak had a vampire course at Kent State University, which I was attending at the time. This is after he had been um, in my feature film. This is after I had taken one of his other courses. And I knew he taught this vampire course, and I knew, like, for a few years I had been trying to get into this class, but it just never worked out with my schedule, and finally, my last semester of college, I was able to get into the class. And my attitude going into this class was that I was going to know not everything about the films we were talking about, but I thought I would at least have heard of every single film that we, had, we were planning on watching in the class. Um, like, for example, if, even if, if I hadn't seen something, I figured I would at least be aware of it because I knew like in the class, OK, we're going to talk about Dark Shadows. I had never seen Dark Shadows, but I was familiar with the character. I was familiar with sort of how that series, you know, shifted vampirism. Um, I was familiar with it, like similar to films like uh, The Return of Dracula, like from the 50s. Never seen it, but I was at least sort of aware of it. I had heard about it before. I went into the class thinking, okay, I would have at least heard of all of the films that we were going to talk about. Um, and for the most part, I was right. But there was a surprise in the class when we got to the 70s. Because I had assumed, all right, 70s, we're going to be talking about Salem's Lot. We're going to be talking about the 70s versions of Dracula, um, which we did. We talked about those films. But there was a sleeper hit. There was the most well-known, least-known vampire film of all time. And that, of course, is The Night Stalker. Um, somehow, I had never heard of it before. Um, but Mark, who was, of course, the teacher of the class, as I mentioned, literally, he, he wrote the book on Kolshak, um, which we'll get into in a little bit. He's a huge Kolshak fan, knows everything about the character inside and out. Um, and yeah, I had never heard of it before. I don't know how, I don't know why. Um, also, he gave the warning because he knew that a lot of people in the class hadn't heard of this film before. And he gives the warning that, hey, the main character in this is from a Christmas story. He plays the dad. Um, so it sort of just gives everyone like sort of a precaution before they watch it. Like, ooh, who do I know that guy? So they're not scratching their head during the film. He just straight up says that. He said that also um, with another film that we watched. It was... Um, 
one of the films that Boris Karloff was in. Um, House of House of Frankenstein or House of Dracula, whichever one of those we watched in the class, I can't remember exactly which one. Probably House of Frankenstein. Um, Boris Karloff's in that film, and he says, "Hey, just so you know, this is the voice of the Grinch." So you're not sitting there watching the film, sort of scratching your head. So he said that this was the guy from A Christmas Story, and A Christmas Story is also something I wasn't that familiar with at the time. I had always written it off as, "Oh, this this really overrated film. They play it 24 hours. Blah blah blah. How good could it possibly be?" Um, so I knew very, very little about Darren McGavin as it was. I knew very, very little about him as an actor. So this film completely caught me off guard. Um, again, even when we're talking about like stuff like in that class, like the Spanish version of Dracula, very familiar with the Spanish version of Dracula, seen it a few times. This one was the only, I want to say this was the only film in the class I had never, ever heard of in my entire life. Um, so maybe that says something about me as a horror fan that I hadn't heard about it, or maybe it's something just with my age range or how the film was made. It was not a theatrical film. It was a television film. Um, but today's episode is just going to be a huge celebration about Kolshak because after discovering Kolshak through Mark's class, it's been something that has been very, very close to me since then. I fell in love with the film. Um, I liked the sequel. I fell in love with the show. Um, just everything about this character, everything about this world is just something that I don't know how I went like 23, 24 years out of my life without hearing about it. And I don't know. It's something I'm very, very happy to have in my life now. It's something I definitely plan on doing more episodes about in the upcoming year. 2022, of course, the 50th anniversary of this character, of this universe, um, from the film, the first film that had come out. Um, and yeah, I think that's a pretty decent introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. So, of course, if you are a seasoned veteran of Kolshak the Night Stalker, a lot of this stuff isn't new to you. Um, but for those of you that have never heard about Kolshak before, I want to just sort of go through both the films the series, um, some of the books that have been made about Kolshak, um, and some other things here and there as they come to my mind. I have some general notes written down, but we're just going to see where the conversation is going to go, which is how I like to keep my episodes. I like to keep them loose, like to keep them unscripted for the most part. Love to just go with the flow and see where the conversation takes myself. So what is so appealing about these films? What is so appealing about this series? That would be, well, really, it's a, I, Mark refers to it in his book as, you know, like a four-headed monster. Um, the combination of, <clears throat> excuse me, wow, I had a big cough right there. A combination of Richard Matheson writing the teleplays, Jeff Rice creating the character, Dan Curtis bringing it to life, and of course, Darren McGavin embodying everything about this character. Um, and the character is really, really what sells this series. Um, and the, the fan base for this character and for this show is off the charts. Um, if you guys aren't aware of it, there's even a Facebook group that has like almost 30,000 members on it on Facebook. And it's a very, very active group. So the interest for Kolshak is definitely there. Um, but yeah, if you haven't heard about this show before, this is going to be my way of sort of introducing you to the series. And we're going to start with the character himself. Carl Kolshak, of course, portrayed by Darren McGavin, which I had already said. Um, from Kolshak's wiki, this is our description of our character. Born in 1922, Carl served for two years during World War II, spending most of that time behind a typewriter though his actual time in the field resulted in a sustaining a knee injury that prevented him from serving in the military again. After the war, he graduated from Columbia University with a BA in journalism. He later served in Vietnam, likely as a war reporter. He worked as a copy boy in Chicago before moving on to rapid successions of hirings and firings, twice in Chicago, three times in Washington, three times in Boston, and twice in New York City, before ending up in Las Vegas at the Daily News in 1963 with Tony Vincenzo serving as his managing editor. That's a little background of our character, how he got to where he is in the film. But that doesn't tell you about our character's personality. Um, he is hes a loose cannon, basically. He's self-righteous. He's wisecracking. 
Um, and throughout the course of his series, um, he's, he's basically a vigilante. He doesn't start out that way. He doesn't start out in the first film as someone who wants to, you know... He doesn't start off as like a conspiracy theorist. Oh, it's got to be monsters. It's got to be vampires. It's got to be this, this, and that. He's looking at it from a logical perspective. And that's what really makes it so believable. Because he's not coming in as some like crazy guy. He's coming into it as being a good reporter and doing his due diligence and doing his research. And he's not making assumptions. He's using the facts to show that this man, whatever he is, thinks he's a vampire or is a vampire in this first film. Of course, it goes on in, this, in the second film and in the series. He always uses realism. He never goes in saying, oh, someone died. It must be, you know, Bigfoot or it must be this or that. He goes in doing what a good reporter does. And that's what really makes him... Such a great character, in my opinion. Um, a reporter turned vigilante. But he also has this edge where, especially in the first film, he knows that writing the good story about this vampire not only is going to serve the public well, it's not only going to be doing something to protect the people and not because it's the right thing to do, but there's also always this lingering... I don't want to say, like, selfishness, but there's this lingering motive where this story is going to help him in his professional life. So there's, like, this duality where he wants to do the story because he wants to get back to the big time. He wants to get back to New York City, but he also is doing it because he's a genuine good person and the people need to be safe and he needs to protect them. He's the protector. No one else is taking him seriously, and if they take him seriously, they are trying to bring him down. This, of course, comes in an era where there's a lot of uncertainty with the government. There's a lot of weird things going on, like, politically and with the police force um, and the media. There's all these things going on around this time in the 70s. Of course, this is the 50th anniversary. This is 1972. Um, and it also this year is special because the actor who portrayed him was born in 1922. So he would be turning 100 years old. So the 100th anniversary of Darren McGavin, 50th anniversary of Kolshak the Night Stalker. Um, and this is the role that I feel Darren McGavin was born to play. He was born to play Kolshak. His energy, his quick wit, and real understanding of the character. He becomes Kolshak. He's not an actor playing a part. It is one of the most believable performances of all time, in my opinion. You never get the sense that he's phoning it in. You never get the sense that what he's saying he doesn't believe you feel completely engrossed into his character. You feel that he believes what he's saying. He is Carl Kolshak. Darren McGavin was born to play Kolshak. Um, one of the best vigilantes, one of the best vampire hunters of all time, in my opinion. Um, and the personality and the reason that he's so good in this role is that a lot of it came from McGavin himself. Um, of course, it was based on an unpublished novel by Jeff Rice, um, which we'll get into later when we talk about some of the books about Kolshak. But the character in the book is very, I don't know what how to describe it, but it's unlike the character that Darren was portraying. Darren changed the attitude, he changed the outfit, and he really gave him a lot of the personality traits that are now known with the character and have been implemented in the character in the novelizations and comic books, graphic novels since then. Um, he really made the character his own. He made it endearing. Um, Kolshak is a very, very lovable guy, but you definitely see why he gets himself into trouble. And you definitely see how drama doesn't follow him. It rides on his back. Um, you definitely see how he gets himself into these situations. Um, you love him. You absolutely adore this character watching this show. Um, his career as a journalist but he's basically a detective, eventual vigilante, as I said. And he walks a fine line where he is a crusader that believes that the people should know the truth, but also knows that it's a good story people are going to really sink their teeth into. No pun intended, um, as I said. 
Um, he's anti-authoritarian. He's a seeker of truth. Um, and his relationship with his boss is incredible. Um, his relationship with, uh, later on in the series, how he gets himself into trouble um, with the police force, and he has some friends that work at the news station with him. Um, and you just really get the sense that everyone, not the police force, but you get the sense that, like, his co-workers, like, they also are charmed by this guy. And they know that although he's a troublemaker, they still like him. Um, especially with his boss, Tony Vincenzo. You know that Tony knows that Carl is a good reporter and he's doing the good truth and he's, you know, he's a great guy. But Tony knows that if he publishes these stories, he's going to look ridiculous. And that he, he has a soft spot for Carl, but he needs to keep his foot down on him. He needs to hold him back because you have to. You can't publish in the newspaper that Vampire is on the loose in Las Vegas and stuff like that. Um, and even when he does agree, sort of, in one of the films, he the police step in and he can't do it. Um, but Vincenzo deserves his own introduction because beca besides Carl, he is the only character that appears in both films and in the series. And is in every episode, he is... I don't want... He's a supporting character. Like, I don't want to say that they're both the main characters. Vincenzo is definitely a supporting player. In some episodes, he barely has anything to do or is barely in it at all. But the relationship between the two of them is flat out. It's comedy gold. It, it They're one of the best comedic duos I can think of. Um, so to give his little introduction from his wiki on the Kolshak wiki... Tony Vincenzo is Kolshak's long-suffering boss, who somehow keeps ending up hiring him despite the disastrous supernatural cases that Kolshak is always getting involved in. Played by Simon Oakland, who, of course, is most probably well-known by horror fans as the guy at the end of Psycho who gives the analysis of what was really going on in Norman Bates' head because people... Back then, the concept of the split personality may have been a little too complex. So there's this really sort of tacked-on ending where Simon Oakland comes out who plays like a psychologist and basically has to explain everything that happened in Psycho. He's also a Twilight Zone veteran um, who was in the Rip Van Winkle caper. Um, and yeah, he, he's a great actor, great character actor. Of course, he was in a lot of other shows around this time. Just like Darren, they were in a lot of shows, a lot of TV movies, stuff like that. Um, Vincenzo is always annoyed by Kolshak's attitude, believing that Kolshak thinks he's worthy of a more prestigious job. He is perpetually stressed out and irritable, and sometimes done, does things just to spite Kolshak. However, he recognizes that Kolshak is a great reporter, which is why he keeps rehiring him, despite the disasters that Kolshak brings on him. On some level, he may recognize that Kolshak's bizarre stories are true, especially since he has been the victim of cover-ups by higher authorities. However, he often resists the unbearable, even if it seems like the only logical answer and is also supported by outside data, probably due to his longing for a more peaceful, ordered resistance. Um, and I meant to say unbelievable in that sentence. I read it wrong. I'll read it again, just quickly. He often resists the unbelievable, even if it seems like the only logical answer. Um, basically because, yeah, he's been through some tough times too, and he wants things to be normal. He just wants Carl to publish a normal story because he wants the newspaper to do well, and he wants to be seen as a reputable editor of a newspaper. He can't be publishing all this ridiculous shit because it's going to come back on him, and they're going to be like, like, I can't believe this Vincenzo guy is letting this be released in his paper. Um, so it's a great sort of balance between the two of them. They're always fighting, going back and forth, and that's what makes some of the episodes in the film so great, is just watching them, their banter. And of course, Kolchak has banter with everyone. It's usually an enemy, but it's always funny to see Kolchak going with a friend, essentially, um, going back and forth, where you know that they're sort of on the same team, but Vincenzo has to have some sort of reputation Vincenzo has to be the one who shuts him down. But it's always fun seeing their banter and seeing how Carl can try to convince Vincenzo to let him do the story. And of course, the first time that we were able to see this relationship and see this all come together was 50 years ago today, 
original air date of the Night Stalker film was January 11th, 1972, which was also a Tuesday. So very, very fitting that today is Tuesday and the film came out on a Tuesday night in the 70s. Um, of course, as I already mentioned, it was based on the novel by Jeff Rice, teleplay by Richard Matheson, produced by Dan Curtis, and directed by a guy named John Moxley. Not Moxley, not John Moxley to be confused with AEW, um, but a nice, soft-spoken man named John Moxley, who really brought a lot of vision to the film, although he's not as historically significant as some of the other major players like Dan Curtis, uh, Matheson, and all that. Of course, Richard Matheson, writer of I Am Legend, the writer of many Twilight Zone episodes, um, one of the greatest horror sci-fi writers, just writers in general um, of our time. Um, Dan Curtis, of course, who produced Dark Shadows. He did one of the 70s versions of Dracula. Um, he did Trilogy of Terror, um, another big, like, sort of unsung hero of the horror genre. Then you have Jeff Rice, who created the character in his novel, which, again, we'll talk about a little bit towards the end of the episode. Um, and, yeah, it was a big deal in the 70s, but it's relatively obscure today, this film. Again, as I said, I had never heard of it. Um, but the film itself and the series, um, they really influenced a lot at the time and the stuff that filmmakers that were up and coming or they were kids at the time would later do with their own work. Of course, everyone knows that Kolshak, the Night Stalker in this universe, you know, and it inspired Chris Carter, Josh Whedon, um, Joe Dante, um, all of these guys that in the next couple decades would start making stuff, you know, like the X-Files, Supernatural. Um, it was a huge influence on the time and culture right before my generation. Um, a lot of people in that Facebook group, as I mentioned, I'm probably one of the youngest. A lot of them watched Kolshak as a kid, um, and they grew up with it. Like, my generation, no one has heard about this. So I'm hoping if this show introduces some people my age to the Cole Shack verse. Um, it's doing, it's doing a good thing. Um, it's the best known on, it's the best known unknown vampire story as, of all time. Like I've said, um, and part of the reason why maybe it's so obscure is that it's n wasn't a theatrical film. This was a television film. Um, and nowadays it's hard to imagine how big of a deal it was to premiere this on TV because we're so disconnected from the TV watching era in that sense. I mean, today it's all streaming. You've got like Disney plus with like WandaVision and stuff like that. But back then, I mean, there were only a couple networks on TV. So when people were watching something, it was a big deal. It was like a cultural thing. Everyone was watching the same thing, basically. Um, so you sort of lose that in today's generation because there's so many things to watch. And nowadays, I mean, like, when you think of TV movies, what do you think? When you think of TV movies, you think of the Hallmark Channel, right? All those crappy Christmas movies. Or you think of, like, some t cheesy, like, Disney Channel original movie or weird, like, miniseries, stuff like that. But back then, there was, like, movies of the week. Like, TV movies were a big deal. They weren't as big of a deal as, like, theatrical stuff. They weren't given the budget. They weren't given, you know, the time to make them as you would with, like, a Hollywood film. But I can't imagine seeing this on free TV back in the 70s. Um, because, honestly, it's if they would have given it a little bit bigger of a budget, um, this is basically feature film theatrical quality. It wasn't shot like a feature film. But I think the character, I think the script, I think the world they created could have been something, given a little bit more money and more time, it could have been a theatrical film. I think as it is, you could have played it in theaters and it would have been fine. But I bet they were really kicking themselves when they saw the numbers it was going to do and that they didn't release it theatrically. Um, of course... Um, as I said, today, we don't get that sort of thing. If it's not a theatrical film, it's not really a big deal. Um, again, the TV films are the hallmark films. The TV films are things that it's not even really worth, you know, making episodes like this about. And I'm sure there's good stuff out there, but it's not like it was back in the day. They used to do movies every single week. And Kolshak the Night Stalker, for a time, had the highest rating of any television film of all time. 
Um, it was a big deal. Everyone was watching it. But nowadays, very, very obscure. Um, the concept of it, I mean, it's a guy... Um, I'll read the letterbox. I'll read the letterbox description of what Kolshak the Night Stalker is. Because that'll give you a little synopsis of the film. Because in today's sense, it seems a bit tired. But back then, I mean, you didn't really see a lot of stuff like this at the time. Wisecracking reporter Carl Kolshak investigates a string of gruesome murders in Las Vegas. It seems that each victim has been bitten in the neck and drained of all their blood. Kolshak is sure that it is a vampire. He's hot on the trail, but nobody believes him. His editor thinks he's nuts, and the police think he's a hindrance in the investigation. So Kolshak takes matters into his own hands. I mean, you can think of things like this, oh, the boy cried wolf and he was right, and stuff like that. But really, at the time, and I can think of, like, other films and TV shows and stuff like that that have done that these days. But back then, as I said, it was relatively new. Um, it was, like, nothing you may have seen before on TV, at least in that quality. Um, of course, as I said, the cops don't believe him. They threaten him. Um, and if Kolshak keeps causing trouble, he, things are not going to turn out well for this guy. Um, it's very comedic, of course, but... It also plays just as well as a horror film, particularly in the third act. Um, it has a really, really iconic intro, um, which I played for you at the beginning of this episode of him in the hotel room. It has a very, very unsettling opening credit sequence where you're witnessing like the autopsy. Um, there's a lot of things in this film that just really work the way it blends together. Like, as I said, it's not all Darren, although he's the driving force that keeps you watching the entire series. That first film and the second film, it's really all of that four-headed monster coming together. The writing, the just the creation of the universe from Jeff Rice, um, John Moxie's direction. As I said, you get like this straight-up shot as if you're the dead body getting the autopsy. Um, it's very well directed, very well produced, written. Um, everything is just really well crafted in that first film. Um, as I said, it was the most viewed TV movie ever made to that point. Um, it's been surpassed since, um, by other things, but at the time it had, um, a 33.2 rating, which is one third of households were watching it in a 54 share, which was the percentage of the audience at the time, meaning half the people watching television were watching it 54 share. So 54% of the people watching television at the time were we're watching this show. Um, it was very reflective of the time period in which it was made. As I said, a lot of uncertainty in the nation. I mean, what was going on in nineteen in the early seventies? Not much. Vietnam, Watergate, uh, no one trusting the government. Um, similar to today, I guess. But you really get a sense of the seventies in this film. Um, it's very low budget, limited effects. Um, but you'll be blown away by the performances. You'll be blown away by how well written it is and the quick wit involved in it. Um, and it still really, really holds up today. Um, of course, this was premiering on ABC back in the day. Um, a Disney-owned company now, so Disney owns the right to Coal Shack, um, which is sort of a good and bad thing. Um, but it is what it is. Um, it's very unique in its sense of its vampire. He's very animalistic. Um, he still wears a suit, he's still high class, but he's a very clumsy vampire. He's very, I don't know how to describe him other than animalistic. He's breaking into hospitals, stealing blood, stuff like that. And this isn't going to be a full breakdown of everything in the film. Again, I would love to do an episode really, really breaking down the film and talking about everything that happens in the film, giving it a full review. This is just an introduction. Um, it's only an hour and 17 minutes. It's more than worth your time. Really suspenseful and has a really, really creepy ending when it does become that straight horror section. Um, it does kind of clash with the rest of the film, but it works because you need those slower comedic moments to really make the ending scary, which it is. Um, while the first two thirds have fun, the ending is all business. So many talented people behind the scenes. Such a great setting and time period for the film to take place. This is basically proto Vegas, pre Vegas. Um, not the Vegas we know today. It's not the Vegas we see if we were to go to Vegas now. It was just becoming that. Um, 
it's getting there. It's not fully the Vegas we recognize. So it's a very unique setting. Um, the only thing I really miss about, and I won't say miss because it hadn't happened yet, but I wish you had the iconic Kolshak whistle at some point in the film. But of course that was introduced in the series. Um, it really transports you back to that time period, but it doesn't feel dated. It takes you back to the seventies, but it doesn't feel out of place. I guess it doesn't feel like you're watching. It doesn't feel like you're watching something old. It feels like you've been transported into an older time. Similar to like silent films. Like when you're watching, when I watch silent films, I feel like I'm really transported into this different era. I don't feel like, oh, I'm watching something old. Like sometimes if I watch like a comedy from the 80s, I'm just like, this feels dated. It doesn't transport you back into the feeling and the setting of when it was made. The Night Stalker really does with that first feature film. Um, and of course, the following year, it was followed up with The Night Strangler with an original air date of January 16th, 1973. So a few days from now, five days in the future, it'll be the 49th anniversary of The Night Strangler. Um, based on some of the characters by Jeff Rice, teleplay again by Richard Matheson, directed and produced by Dan Curtis, who really wanted to direct the first film as well. Um, but that's a whole other story to get into at some point. Of course, our iconic duo returns, um, with Vincenzo and Kolshak. Um, it does require you to suspend your disbelief more than the first one does, especially since this is not only happening again, where Kolshak is finding something supernatural, but you have to suspend your disbelief that it's happening again in a completely new city, in that Kolshak and Vincenzo are in this new city together. Um, discovering their monster. Of course, the first one I said was in Las Vegas. This one is in Seattle. Specifically, parts of it are in underground Seattle, where they, you know, they rebuilt the city on top of it. Um, so it's very, very similar to the first film in structure, but the setting makes it stand out as opposed to the first film. And I think that the second film, although not as good and polished as the first one was, it's still great. Like, I would give the first film five stars. I'd give this one, like, four and a half. Um, it's really, really great as well. It's much more comedic than the first film. I feel like they really got a sense, okay, this Kolshak guy is funny, so we really are going to amp up the comedy in this second film. Um, it was successful the first time. Like, your first film, The Night Stalker, was successful, so why not do the same thing again with The Night Strangler? The plots are very, very similar, um, but as I said, it is more comedic, um, and it's not as scary. The villain is similar. It's not a vampire, but it's a very similar type of villain, um, and it's just not as threatening as a vampire, which also makes it not as great as the first one. The villain just isn't quite there. Um, he has a good character, but the first vampire um Yano Skorzeny um played by Barry Atwiler in the in the first film is just so good um it doesn't go super into his backstory we really get a lot of backstory of this character in the second film the villain who is an alchemist he comes back every 21 years um and he does his killings and a lot of that goes into the history like Carl's in the re doing the research seeing that every 21 years the same things are happening in this town. It's not just a coincidence. Um, it has to be the same person. Um, again, he's doing the logical steps. Um, the original version of this was over two hours, but they cut it down to an hour and a half, and then slightly back to over an hour to fit the time, the 90 minute time slot. So they had it two hours, they cut it down, and then they added a little bit more in. Um, I will say, if you like the relationship between Vincenzo and Kolshak, this second film is really where it's at, um, because there's a lot of banter between the two of them. There's a lot of banter, um, between Carl and, um, the people that he's, um, I forget, I f I'm losing my train of thought, the, like, the police captains and stuff like that. This has one of, like, my favorite Kolshak quotes of all time, where he's basically, like, Oh, I've been a reporter for 23 years or however long. And the cop is like, well, I've been an inspector for 30. And Kolchak says, well, why don't you retire? Um, the comedy is just very, very quick-witted in the second film. I'm not really selling it well here, but trust me, the comedy is good in the second one. 
Um, it also has a good supporting cast for a little, like for as little we get to see of the supporting cast. The supporting cast is really good in this. Um, it has the Wicked Witch of the West um, playing Miss Crabwell in the film. Uh, Margaret Hamilton, the actress. Um, Al Lewis only appears in the film in the 90 minute version. And he doesn't have much to do, but it's great to see Grandpa Munster in there. Um, John Carradine is in there. Um, just a really, really great supporting cast. Um, and the reason why this exists, the reason the main selling point to see this film is why wouldn't you want to spend more time with this character? Um, again, it retreads a lot of the same story beats as the original. Um, no one believing Carl, fights, killings, confrontations. You know, you guys know the whole drill. Um, but it is the character and the world that this has created that is really, really selling it. And that's what's going to sell you on the next thing we're talking about, which is the series. There was ideas floating around of making a third Kolshak film, but instead we got the show, simply called Kolshak the Night Stalker. That's who he is. Um, originally airing on ABC from September 13th, 1974 to August 30th, 1975, um, from September to December, it had the time slot of Friday nights from 10 to 11. But then in January to August, it moved earlier in the night, also still on Fridays, but from 8 o'clock to 9, which are both very, very hard time slots. Um, think about what you guys do on a Friday night, uh, maybe before COVID times. But what, would, what do people like to do on Friday nights? They like to go out. They like to go to sporting events. They like to go to the theaters. They like to see their friends, go get a drink at the bar or whatever. Friday nights are a really hard time slot to get people to watch television, which is a contributing factor to why this only lasted one season for 20 episodes. They might have been able to pull it off and do some more, um, but there's tons of like factors that go into it. Um, such as Darren allegedly doing a lot of things behind the scenes that he wasn't credited for, like being the de facto producer for the series, not being given credit. He would touch up the scripts. Um, he would do all this kind of stuff, and he was just kind of burnt out. And he wasn't really a fan of the Monster of the Week segment. Because like they did in the first film and the second film, if, it's, if it was successful those two times, why not do it again and again and again and again? It was a Monster of the Week show. Um, and Darren wasn't really too much of a fan of that, although he was a fan of the character. So there's a lot of contradicting stories on why the series didn't pan out. Um, but as it stands, we got 20 episodes of this character, which is what we want. Of course, Vincenzo is there as well along for the ride. Although he's not as important as he was in those first two films, it seems. This is really the Carl Kolshak show. Um, it has a lot of great people involved. It was story. The story editor was David Chase, who of course would later on create The Sopranos. There was an episode written by Robert Zemeckis, of all people, of course from Who Framed Roger Rabbit fame, Back to the Future. Um, he wrote the episode called Chopper. There was a lot of players involved in this show that would later go on to do good things in the 80s and 90s. Um, as I said, it's only 20 episodes. And there's conflicting reports on how it got canceled, but it probably would have got canceled anyway due to the difficult time slot. Um, again, the show has an underdog, hip mentality, just like the character itself. Um, young writers were involved on the show, not horror writers. Only one episode was written by an actual horror writer, which is one of the best episodes of the show. It's called Horror in the Heights. Um, the show was produced by Universal, but it was licensed through ABC. And I really like the show. Again, there's not too, too much to say about the show without breaking down every single episode in depth and talking about things that happened in every single episode. The theme song is absolutely iconic. Again, I talked about the whistling, how I wish it was a part of the first film. Of course, it didn't exist at the time. Um, I'll just list off some of the episodes. Um and talk about them very, very briefly. Episode 1 was The Ripper um, from September 13th. Um, episode 2 was The Zombie from September 20th. Episode 3, There Have Been, There Are, There Will Be, which was about aliens. That was from September 27th. Episode 4 was The Vampire. 
Episode 5 was The Werewolf. Episode 6 was Firefall. Episode 7, The Devil's Platform. Episode 8, Bad Medicine. Episode 9, The Spanish Moss Murders, which is another one of my favorites. Episode 10, The Energy Eater. 11, Horror in the Heights, which is regarded by a lot of people in the community as the absolute best episode. Mr. Ring was episode 12. Episode 13 was called Primal Scream. Episode 14 was The Trevi Collection. Episode 15 was Chopper, which was written by Zemeckis. Episode 16, Demon and Lace. 17, Legacy of Terror. 18, The Nightly Murders. Like, nightly, like a knight, like a medieval knight. Episode 19 was The Youth Killer, and episode 20 was The Sentry, which a lot of people see as the worst episode in the series. Some of my favorite episodes, I'll just list some of my favorites off the top of my head. I love The Vampire. It really feels like the follow-up to the two films. Um, it has a great supporting cast. It has um, William Daniels, who played Mr. Feeney in it. Um, I love the episode The Werewolf, which is the closest Kolshak gets to a Christmas episode, even though it has really nothing to do with Christmas. It really, I like it because it changes the setting. Um, the werewolf episode takes place on a cruise ship rather than in the city. Of course, this moves them again, so it makes you suspend your disbelief even further that not only is this happening 20 more times, but also Carl and Tony are now in another city. They're in Chicago. Um, I love the Spanish Moss Murders, as I already said. I love Horror in the Heights. Um, and I have a soft spot for Chopper, and I actually have a soft spot for The Sentry, too, um, just because it's so cheesy and fun. Um, but again, I can admit that it's a guilty pleasure. Um, of course, the series was finally released on a nice Blu-ray set um, last October um, with a great booklet, of course, also written by Mark Dewidziak. The Truth is in here. Nice booklet that has lots of information about the series. The Blu-ray is chock full of extras um, with commentaries, stuff like that. Um, and just to wrap things up about the, the films and the series, and then we'll talk about the books a little bit, um, I just want to go through some of the versions of this that I have. So I have Kolshak the Night Stalker, um, at the first film, just the Night Stalker on VHS, still sealed, which I will never open. Um, and I have another version of it on VHS, which is opened, which I have watched on VHS. Um, I also have the VHS of the Night Strangler, which is in a clamshell case. Um, it's a little busted. It's seen its better days, but I still am very happy I have it in my collection. There is a DVD pack of the two of them, but it's very rare and out of print. I do not have that. But I do have both films on Blu-ray released by Kino Lorber. Um, the Night Stalker, of course, has this beautiful cover um, in a reddish purple. And then the Night Strangler plays on a similar design, but it's blue. Love those releases. Of course, I have... Cole Shack the Night Stalker, the series on DVD, which is how I watched the entire series for the first time. I've seen the series every episode at least once, but the episodes that I really like, I've seen at least three or four times. But I've seen every episode in the show at least once, and I watch them all on this DVD that they have. It's very low quality, like the video quality is not the best, but I love the main menu, um, how it sort of zooms in. And we talk about that in the Christmas special on Cole Shack's Loop. But the version to get if you want to watch the series, because it is available on some streaming services with ads, and again, the quality is not that good, the best way to get it is on the new Blu-ray set, as I mentioned. Um, Cole Shack, The Night Stalker, the complete series, also released by Kino Lorber. Um, this is really the way to experience the series. So I would recommend getting the three Blu-rays. I would recommend getting the Blu-ray of the series and the Blu-ray of the two movies. So that's pretty much all I'm going to say about the releases and all I'll say really about the films in a review slash description sort of way. I want to talk about some of the books just very, very briefly, just to give you an introduction on how Kolshak started and how the legacy continues even to this day. There was a, another series of Kolshak, a very, very short-lived reboot um, in the mid-2000s. I think it had like 10 episodes produced, but only like three or four of them actually aired. Um, so it was really seen as like a failure. Um, and it's not that important 
in terms of the Kohl Shack we're talking about now. Again, that could be a whole nother conversation. Um, and I'd love to do an episode about that show because I've never seen it. I've never seen any episodes of the Kohl Shack series from the 2000s. I just heard it was a failed venture. Um, so it's an interesting thing to study and maybe sometime I'll talk about it in the future, but we're going to dive into the books, of course, starting from the very beginning. The first book, which was then unpublished, was known as the Kohl Shack Tapes and then the Kohl Shack Papers, but it's more commonly just known as the Night Stalker or Kohl Shack the Night Stalker, just like the series in the show. Um, Rice himself, who was the author of the original book who created the character and put a lot of himself into the character also put himself in the novel. Um, Jeff Rice is a character in the novel. The novel is portrayed very realistically um, as such similar. I don't want to say similar to Dracula because it's journal entries, stuff like that, but it's made to seem as if that Kolshak is a real person and these are real, real things that happen. Kolshak is telling his story to Jeff Rice, who is then publishing the novel on Kolshak's behalf, basically. It's him telling the story of Kolshak that Kolshak is telling Rice, as if Kolshak is a real human being. Um, as I said, it went unpublished, but they took the framework from the story, and that's what they adapted the first feature film into, um, and I don't want to spend too much time on the books, per se, mainly because I'm not as familiar with all of the books within the Kolshak verse, uh, mainly because you can fall down a rabbit hole. There are so many Kolshak graphic novels, short stories, um, just comic books in general, no novellas. There's so many things that Moonstone Publishing, um, who is in charge of the Kolshak um, the written work of Kolshak these days. There's so much stuff they've been putting out. Of course, there is the 50th anniversary Kickstarter um, that's launching. I believe it. I believe it launched today, if not a couple days ago, for the Kolshak 50th anniversary. Um, what's it called? Graphic novel, which is going to be an anthology novel with a bunch of Kolshak stories written by a bunch of different authors. And the reason I don't want to go too in depth with a lot of these Kolshak books is because I haven't read all of them, obviously. The only ones that I have read are the original novel, Mark Dewitzi has a book, the, Nart the Night Stalker Companion, and the Kolshak Papers Grave Secret, which was also written by Mark Dewitziak. So I can really only speak in sort of depth about those ones. And I probably should have talked about the book at the beginning. I guess hindsight is 2020. Um, but it did start with the book. The book went unpublished. They created it into the show. And that, well, I mean the, the first movie rather. And then from there, it's history. There was the second book of the Kolshak Papers, which was off of the Night Strangler story. But it wasn't like the Night Strangler movie was based off the novel. It was basically a novelization of the movie. But the difference is, is it retains a lot of the Kohl Shack book characteristics rather than Darren's portrayal of him on screen. Um, because as I said, Darren put a lot of himself into the character. The character in the book is very, I don't want to say very different, but it's a definitely a different type of character. He wears like Hawaiian shirts. He smokes cigars. Um, it's just a very different character than Darren's portrayal with the seersucker suit and the hat um, and the tape recorder. Um, the version of Kolshak we see on screen is not the same Kolshak that's in the novel. The framework is there, but Darren's personality per se isn't there. That would come with the later works, where it's really doing a lot of the characteristics from the show and being put into the novel. The first two novels were not really like that. Um, and of course, the third sequel is Grave Secrets, which I said was written by Mark Dewitziak. So this came many, many years after. This was in the 90s, and it was the first official Kolshak sequel written by one of Kolshak's biggest experts. Um, Jeff Rice entrusted Mark in writing Grave Secrets, which takes Kolshak. So Kolshak had been in Chicago. He had been in... Seattle. He had been in Las Vegas, obviously. This is taking him to two places that Kolshak hasn't been up until that point. Los Angeles, 
and my neck of the woods, Northeast Ohio. He's in both places in the novel. Uh, Mark, of course, also Northeast Ohio. Um, I believe he was living here when this happened because that all the timelines add up. Um, and I sense a lot of Mark in this book as well, but maybe if I ever do like a full book review of this, um, which I'd be open to doing. I have read the book. I read it last year. Very, very good book. Um, very fitting. Um, Kolshak sequel. Um, very good. I, I, I recommend it. If I, again, I said if I ever want to do a full book review, I really want to go in depth about it. But it takes Kolshak closer to home. It takes him to the Firelands. It takes him to places that I'm familiar with. So I really enjoy the story because of that. Uh, Mark's writing is top notch. It this is this novel combines the Kolshak Jeff Rice's Kolshak with the cigars and Darren's version of Kolshak. This was the first one where they were kind of like meshed together per se, um, and it involves characters from the show as well, like Ron Updike um, and Miss Emily. Um, so this is really where Kolshak sort of comes together. Um, I really enjoy the book. Again, I might do a full review of it at some point. Um, Mark's other book, and when I said he wrote the book on Kolshak, this is the book I'm talking about. It was Night Stalking, originally later republished as the Night Stalker Companion. And finally, they're doing a re-release um, of this book because it's been so hard to get both versions have been out of print forever so they're finally doing a new somewhat updated version um the interior of the book is going to be the same like the same um stuff is going to be published but there's going to be additional stuff at the beginning and additional stuff at the end sort of like book and book ending it this is a really really great book like this is the book to get if you're a Cole Shack fan when it is republished um because it breaks down both films it breaks down the novel it breaks down every episode of the show there's behind the scenes details there's interviews there's so much information just chalked into this thing um and it really is a must-have if you like the show he did a colombo book as well if you're a colombo fan that's the book to get um but these this book the night stalker companion as i said it's very hard to get out of print for a collector's sake i do have the 25th anniversary edition on the Night Stalker Companion, um, and they go for pretty, pretty steep prices online. Um, so it's going to be great when they finally have the updated version, which is going to be more universally available. Um, and it'll also have more information because it's going to cover some stuff from, like, the Moonstone books that have been published since. It's going to have stuff to do with the, the 2000s reboot, which I talked about a little bit. Um, it's just going to be a really, really great thing. Um, so definitely make sure you guys pick that up when it comes out. And as I said, there's just like a rabbit hole of Kolshak books. I mean, these done crossovers. There's comic books. Um, they published like the script um, from what would have been the third film, The Night Killers. They have a novelization of that. Um, they have all kinds of stuff. Kolshak going up against a, a whole bunch of things. There is like a Kolshak Christmas um, episode that is a comic book. There's so many like Cole Shack things that, as I said, it's really like a rabbit hole. Like, you just go on Moonstone's website and there's so much stuff that it can be hard to know where to begin. So I would say definitely begin with the original novels and Grave Secrets and then just kind of, you know, see what your own personal interest takes. Because as I said, a lot of these graphic novels, they have great covers. So just kind of see like what interests you per se and then maybe you'll latch on to a real uh, an author that you like, because obviously these authors are doing multiple stories. Um, so you're going to come across Kolshak stuff that is really in your niche. So if you're interested in any of the Kolstat, Kolshak books and stuff, I highly recommend going to Moonstone's website and checking out what they have to offer. Um, and definitely get the new Night Soccer Companion when it is out. And donate to the Kickstarter for the 50th anniversary anthology. Um, so that'll be coming out at some point in the future. Um, but that's really, as I said, I don't want to go, I don't want to go too depth in depth. I'm like, that's how, you know, you've been doing a podcast for a long time when you're just like not even making complete sense with your words, but it's coming out fine in your head, but you're saying it out loud and there's just words missing from your sentences. Um, that's really all I want to say about the books at this time. Again, this is just an introduction to Kolshak. This isn't a deep dive into any of the movies, the episodes of the show. So maybe someday I will do in-depth discussions about these books as well as the movie and the series. But for now, that's pretty much all I really wanted to cover for this 50, 50th anniversary special. Um, you had Kolshak big in the 70s. 94, he came back with Grave Secrets. 
Um, and then since then, Moonstone had been publishing all kinds of stuff since then. So there's really not too much to say about these books um, other than there's not much backstory given um, as opposed to the film. The character's different with the cigars, Hawaiian shirts. He's not a blind believer, so that carries over. Um, and yeah, there's not too much to say about them without r really like going super in-depth into them, and I don't really want to do that in this particular episode because I want to try to keep this at about an hour, a good listenable length. Um, but that's all for, for Cole Shack the Night Stalker, man. As I said, it's a really, really touching series to me, very, very close to my heart in the past few years. Cole Shack's gotten me through some tough times, some funny stuff. Um, sometimes you just need a good laugh. You put on an episode of the Night Stalker or a good scare. Um, watch one of the films, watch one of the scarier episodes like Horror in the Heights. Um, really the only critiques that I have of the show aren't of the show in particular, but more like just 70s television in general. Um, just the way they speak. Um, they don't have... There's definitely some things that are said to women and definitely some things about different cultures and stuff that aren't as PC and you definitely couldn't get away with that stuff today. So that's sort of the stuff I'm not really that too much of a fan of in the series. But that's not a Shack specific thing. That's television in general at that time. Um, but I can't recommend the first film enough. Um, as I said, it is one of my favorite vampire stories. It's one of my favorite horror films now. I mean, it's not like in my top five or anything, but it's definitely up there. It's a very, very good, competently made horror film from the 70s. I love horror cinema from the 70s. Of course, me and Bradley did a whole conversation about that, Bradley, from the Cole Shacks Loop. Um, I'm just sort of rambling at this point. I don't really know what else to say other than to just try to wrap this episode up. Um, I hope that you found this informative. If you've never listened to the Cole Shacks Loop before, if you've never seen an episode of Cole Shack the Night Stalker before, if you're going into this completely blind, I hope you found some of the things I had to say informative. And I do encourage you to check these out. Again, if you guys are interested, I would love to do some reviews of these films, more deep dives into the novels, into the films, into episodes of the show. I would love to do like a Night Soccer Sundays type thing. I talked about doing that last year in the House of Horror, but it didn't really plan out with how I had things set up. Um, I didn't really have the time or the resources to do it. So I put it on the shelf and it's on the shelf for now, but I would love to bring it back and go through the whole series, go through both the films, the show, um, and talk about the books. So if that's something you guys want to see, definitely let me know. And that's pretty much it for this episode, you guys. I'm going to start wrapping this up. So, as always, if you guys haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications. If you guys haven't subscribed over on your favorite podcast streaming services, please make sure you go ahead and do that. I do have a voicemail number, which will be in the description below if you want to leave a voicemail call into the show. And that's pretty much it. So I will see you guys for another episode of the House of Horror coming very, very soon. So with that, you guys, just take care and stay spooky.